Genesis 3. Uh, we really covered the first seven verses last week. We'll start tonight in verse 6 just to lay some context and then move forward. So why don't you read together with me and let's begin reading in Genesis 3. We'll pick up. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And then the man said, The woman whom you gave me, who gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, let's just stop there and kind of pull this stuff together for a second. If we want to summarize the motivation of Satan, it's to destroy what God loves. Satan is motivated to destroy whatever God loves. So anything that God loves, anything that is close to, to His heart or near and dear to Him, Satan has an agenda to destroy it. Well now, but what is his agenda? If he's motivated by this act, and what, what does he want to accomplish? He wants to get you to distrust God. So his motivation is a hatred for what God loves, which is really a hatred for God. But it's, it's helpful to know that, to put it in context of hating what God loves, so that way you can sort of understand. And then his agenda is to get us to distrust. Now, nothing has changed at all today because today the greatest challenge that faces every Christian is answering the question, can I really trust God? Whatever struggle you're facing, whatever struggles you face in the past, whatever situation or circumstance you find yourself in, it really always boils down to this question. At the end of the day, for those who know God and are called according to His purpose, it really just boils down to we try to complicate it, we paint it with different picture, uh, colors and try to make things you know, look in certain ways, but it, it really is not complicated. It's just do you trust God? He has said something, and the question is are we going to trust Him in that place? So are we going to trust that God is good even though we want to be married, but we're not? Is that going to be a place where we can trust Him? Uh, hang on, there you go. Or if a person's uh, a person who's not married has to trust God in a lot of things that don't, don't make a lot of sense to them. And at the end of the day, it just comes down to, well, are you going to trust them? And what is going to be the determining factor in that in that decision is going to be not necessarily do I trust God, but do I trust that God is good? that what God says He intends for my good because it seems like what He says is intended for my bad. What about are we going to trust God even though my marriage didn't turn out the way I hoped? So my, I, I trusted God at the altar, but then somewhere along the line, things changed into something that I didn't really foresee, something that I didn't really uh, want to happen or I didn't, I didn't uh, have any idea was going to happen, and now I'm beginning to second guess the, the trust that I once had is now beginning to waver. I'm not sure that what God has to say is good, or even though my health isn't what it's supposed to be. See, this is the great challenge. The great challenge is that when we're honest and we ask ourselves, well, can God change my circumstances? Well, yes. But will you trust that He's good if He doesn't? That's the question. 
What about even though my children have rebelled against God? Every parent in this situation begins to condemn themselves and start reeling through all these different scriptures and promises from God and start thinking, where did I miss it? What is happening? Why is this going on? What did I do wrong? Or you can just fill the blank. And even though whatever it is you want to put in, you just put in. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to do you trust God? Do you trust that He's good? When you start struggling with trusting God, it's always going to get down to the issue is going to be the make or break moment of whether or not you're going to trust God is going to be, is He good? Don't ever forget that. What happened in Genesis 3 in the garden is the same exact thing that happens every day to you and me. Is He good? Is He good? It wasn't, you know, Adam and Eve's problem was they were thinking, you know, maybe He's trying to keep something from us. It was the goodness of God that was the deal breaker. Look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband who was with her. Now I just want to cover a few things we didn't have time to talk about last week. The Lord God said, Yahweh Elohim said that if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And remember, she left surely off. She just said, well, he said that you would die. And we talked about that a little bit. Well, Adam and Eve both died while the taste of the fruit was still in their mouth. There was an instantaneous death that happened in the millisecond that the fruit went into their mouth. So I want to just take five minutes and clarify this so that tonight after we're done, everybody understands exactly what this means. Death, I want you to think this through now. Death is the, re the reverse of, death is a reverse of life. It is not the reverse of existence. To die is to cease to live but it is not to cease to exist. So therefore, what throws people off sometimes is they go, well, God said they would surely die, and yet they're not dead. Oh no, they're dead. You're just not thinking of death in biblical terms. To die does not mean to cease to be. It means to be cut off from the land of the living. So think of it this way. The minute that they, the, they ate of the fruit, they cease to live abundantly, and they began to live this, uh, this jaded, broken, unintended life through the consequences of sin. So, in the Bible, death is never portrayed as ceasing to exist. It is always ceasing to live. And that is a very, very important thing to understand. So the Bible says in Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death. Death, but the gift of God is eternal life in the Lord to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're we're alive, but yet we're dead in our trespasses, right? Well, that's why we don't cease to we're not we're not not existing. We're just not living. So think about it. this. This is how the Bible relates to our condition. Whenever Jesus says, "He who has ears, let him hear," everyone who's there has ears. There's not like a bunch of people over here with no ears. They all have physical ears. So it's the same thing. Jesus isn't saying they don't have ears. He's saying they can't hear. So you may be standing there, breathing in and breathing out, but you're dead. And so they died in that moment. Upon eating the fruit, sin immediately penetrated every sphere of their lives. It was not a gradual process. They didn't ease into fallenness or brokenness. They didn't perpetually get worse and worse and worse. No, they were instantaneously and completely permeated by sin. Everything broke at one time completely. So what happened according to Scripture is that when Adam sinned, we all sinned. Another thing that throws people for a loop sometimes. They don't understand. Well, hey, that's not fair. I wasn't there. Really? You really want to have the fair conversation? Is that the talk you really want to have? Because we can have it. But 
That's not the conversation you want to have. Here's how the Bible explains it. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, just as one through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So whenever somebody says, I wasn't there, that didn't, uh, that doesn't seem fair to me. We just say, well, read Romans 5.12 and then we'll talk about it. In other words, well, you've sinned, so what's not fair about it? In other words, what broke that moment is still broken for every person who is born is born in sin. And it stays broken until a person is born again by the Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's that is how you need to understand death and sinfulness and the transition from, from Genesis 3 into our current lives. So we all died just as He died. So in that moment when death entered, and now they're dead, all of us died. Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2, and you He made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. See, he's talking to these Christians in Ephesus, and he said, well, God made you alive. You were dead in your sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. So you can see that death is not, it's, it's not living. It's not not existing. So it's very important that we get that. Now that we've got all that clarified, we can take the rest of this passage and let it instruct us a little bit more effectively. So the first thing we want to see about sin, now that we understand about death and how sin affects us, is that the effect of sin personally. Because what happened in the garden is of paramount importance to you because you need to understand what happened in Genesis 3 to understand who you are and the struggles you face right now. I mean, it is the... It is the uh, it's, it's the essence of really having a, a harness on the struggle that we face right now is understanding this text. So we sin affects, affected all of us personally. We kind of know that, but we need to see in this text how it happened. Then it will make sense to us. Look at verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and make themselves covering. Okay, so the first thing that happens is innocence is lost. Now, I'm talking about specifically the, the way sin affects them personally and how that translates to us. So there's this lost innocence in this moment. Now, note that there's a fundamental change in the way that they see themselves. In other words, it's so important, my goodness, that we could talk about each of these verses forever. In verse 7, they come to this conclusion on their own, which is so important for you to understand tonight. That they, what sin changed how they see themselves. Now in a minute I'm going to show you how we're all broken in the exact same way. And it's a battle that every single one of us faces. No one is immune from it. But you see, they, they come to this realization through being fallen. Hey, something's wrong with us. No one told them this. God didn't show up and say, oh, and then point out all the ways in which they were broken. You notice that? They come to this conclusion. They see this. You see, they, they both realize that they're naked and they both are ashamed and now we find them sowing fig leaves together to hide themselves. So since the fall, or Adam and Eve have this immediate sense of shame. Immediate. Now why shame? So since the fall, all people battle with a sense of inner distress about who we really are. So hopefully you internally take exception with that statement a little bit. So that's good. So we can kind of... I can push on you. We can fight about it for a second. Do you... Do you battle this sense of inner distress about who you really are? How does that manifest itself? And that's a pretty bold statement. I'm saying every single person. I mean everybody. 
I mean, you got to think that's a that's a large variety of people. But but I'm saying every single person. You know, wh why is it that, for example, if 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 I could press a button on my little remote here and suddenly this video would start playing of of your life, of all the of every secret hidden aspect of your life would start playing on this video. And we're we're in here watching it. Why would that be so distressing to you? Now, now I want you to think about something for a second. Here you're sitting here. And if I start talking about how Jesus has forgiven all your sin and He has wiped your slate clean and and His blood has covered your sin and you're in Him, secure in Him, and boy, everybody's head starts nodding and we are just going with that and we love that. But then, well then why, what are you ashamed of? I thought it was all covered. I thought it was all forgiven. I thought it was all... Why are you... Why would that bother you? Wouldn't it make more sense? I mean, if you were absolutely secure in your salvation, if you had... If you had a firm grip on the, the reality of what being saved is, couldn't you just sit there and go, play it, man, I don't care. Play it. I'm forgiven. Play it. Go ahead. Show it. You can't do it. You cannot do it. You can't. Because there's shame in, embedded in your... As long as you are flesh... Their shame. Every single human person, no matter how much they try to deny it, is ashamed and has this inner battle. No matter how how close a relationship is, no matter whatever you know. Uh, sometimes people think, "Oh man, I've got the best marriage, and we are so close, and we." We have absolutely no secrets and there's no inhibitions between us and we know everything there is about each other. And we and I'm like, praise the Lord, but you're ashamed. You know you're ashamed. You There's no way you want to see that play. You're not going to sit there with your spouse and watch that play. And immediately, that's true. Because of sin. And so it's not just a coincidence that shame pops up here first. No. It's there because it's it's in every one of us. It is an it is an ongoing lifelong battle every day on this earth. To some degree, it's always there. Always, always, always. So the presence of shame is an indicator that something has gone wrong. You see, prior to the fall, shame didn't exist. I mean, it was there was no shame in the garden at all. It was a shame-free environment, which again is just the, you can try to think about that, or but you, but you you can't. Our brain cannot cannot. We have no capacity to comprehend shamelessness. It's impossible. Can't do it. You, can, you just can't because we're it's so embedded in us. That the concept of that they're not being shamed is is just that we can't do it. Adam and Eve have an immediate sense of guilt now that follows this shame. So they're ashamed, but then there's guilt associated with the shame. In other words, immediately when the shame shows up, the next, the very next realization is that. It's wrong to be ashamed. Why are we why are we hiding all of a sudden? Why all, all of this is new. This didn't exist. These thoughts had never come across their mind. And so now we've just careened off this mountain and we, we jumped right into shame. Now we're into guilt. Satan had promised them if they ate of this fruit that they would know good and evil and that they would be like God, remember? That was His promise to them. And so now what's happened is that they know good and evil. But they're not like God. 
But you see the knowledge of good and evil, what it has done? No one has told them that they're naked. Yet they try to cover themselves. How do they know they're naked? I mean, where does the, where does the, the concept of I'm naked, well, if you've only always been naked, then you're not naked, right? But now suddenly, we not only realize that we're naked, although that's all we've ever been, it's like if you've never seen nor wore shoes, you wouldn't know you were barefooted. you just think you were. The only way you could know that you were barefooted is you'd have to see an alternative. An alternative would have to present itself. Well, now suddenly, we've realized that we're naked. And we've responded. Now, now think of how crazy that the, the realization that we're naked is the shame part. But then the guilt part is we're going to cover it. So we, we, we've never known any other thing. We've now realized that we're something that we've never been and that that's not good and so we're going to in guilt now cover it. I find it interesting that when I was looking at the Hebrew words that make up, um, they sewed fig leaves together it and made themselves coverings. It actually, in the original language, the exact translation of that phrase is they made belts. They didn't make like loincloths. They made belts. They literally like, imagine they just took a vine and put it around their waist. Now that really fascinated me. I started thinking, now there's, there's a sermon in that right there. I mean, everybody's going to be uncomfortable if I, you know, spend 50 minutes preaching on nakedness and a vine, but hey. What are they trying to do? You see, we've been, you've been misled all your life by these pictures of them with these little triangular fig leaf made little bikini bottoms. You've been, you've been robbed. Because that's what we think. They were not trying to cover their private area. Why would they do that? They, were, they knew that this feeling that they felt of being naked was wrong, and so their response is they just put a vine around their waist like a belt. We have a perfectly usable Hebrew word for loincloth, not there. Belt. They're not trying to cut. They just they don't know what to do. And so then God solves the problem for them later on. We'll talk about that next week, but I think it's pretty fascinating. So that's the personal. Now let's talk about the effect of sin relationally. Relationally, how does it affect the two of them? Now... There's not only a loss of innocence, but now instantaneously, well, I mean, look at it. We unraveled in warp speed. There's a loss of trust. Like all of this is happening in, in just like the blink of an eye, you're watching humanity unravel before your very own eyes. Right? Just right there. Bam, 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 bam. All at one time. It's astonishing how this is so teaching. So the effect of sin is to hide and to cover, causing an immediate breakdown in communication. In other words, so we, we experience shame, we then experience guilt, and then we start to separate. We want to hide. We want to, we want to differentiate. We want to, we want to put a barrier of some kind. We want to break down communication. Now I want you to note that the first place that sin is demonstrated in the world is in the marriage relationship. Here we are, sin shows up, and all the effects of sin are teaching us through 
the marital relationship of all things. Not brother and sister. Not two brothers, two sisters. Not, no. Husband and wife. In verse 11, the Bible says, And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Then the man said, Well, the woman that you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. So we now have went from guilt to shame to blame. In other words, you know, we've all heard all the jokes about how Adam just throws her under the bus. But what I want you to focus on is I want you to focus on the relational aspect of this sin. How does that make you feel when somebody throws you under the bus? Now understand, a few minutes ago, they were living in perfect, unadulterated harmony in perfection. Absolute, sinless perfection. And just bam, just like that, now all of these things are swirling around them. Just bam, 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 bam. And now we already have this relational breakdown right off the bat. The first words out of his mouth to God is, I'm throwing her under the bus. So this relational breakdown... Any, anybody wondering in this moment, like, hmm, wonder why? Wonder why the marriage relationship is always in the crosshairs of the enemy? Why is it, why is it always a, a daily uh, challenge? Why does it always have to uh, be at the, near the top of our priority list to be careful and cautious and nurture that relationship because it can so easily be damaged? Because here we have, right off the bat, blame and this relational breakdown, and then we have the effect of sin spiritually. We have personally, relationally, and thirdly, spiritually. So there's this spiritual breakdown. There's not only a loss of innocence, there's also a loss of trust and now a loss of fellowship. See, as soon as the relationship breaks down, the next breakdown is always fellowship. Fellowship doesn't break down first. The relationship breaks down first and then the fellowship. If the relationship doesn't break down, then the fellowship continues on, right? Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said, Where are you? And so he said, Well, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So you see there's this breakdown in fellowship. He's running away from which he's never done before. The concept of running from God, he's never thought that before. That's never happened. It's never even been anywhere on his uh, radar screen. And now suddenly he's doing something for the very first time and he's trying to explain himself to God as if, well, well that's what I did. Notice the progression of how Adam relates to God. First, Adam fears God. And not in a healthy fear, but in an afraid, I'm afraid of God. Secondly, he flees God. So he fears God, he flees God, but then he fights God. You see, he doesn't just receive, he, 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 he goes back at God. He says, well, it's your fault, you gave me the woman that caused it to happen. So, so now you understand. This is why I was saying that it all comes down to are we going to trust that God is good? Because what do we do? What, what happens? Suddenly things are... Well, everyone thinks God's good when things are good, but when things aren't good, hmm, how, what, what is our... We start to fear God. What do we think? We think God's doing this to punish me, isn't He? That's why He's doing it. That's why this is happening. That's why I can't get better. That's why this is this way. That's why this is that. So then he's, he's doing this. Well, as soon as you start going down that path, as soon as you say, well, He's doing this to punish me, the number two step in that path is you run away. Anytime anybody's trying to hurt you, you run away. So when you convince yourself you're afraid of God because He's not good, then you run away. And as you're running and God starts pursuing, you start fighting God. You start saying, well, here's why I'm running. I'm running because you didn't do this or you did that or it wasn't the way you said or no, 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 no. And so that's the same thing we do. Same exact thing. After today, I thought, you know what? From now on, all my counseling is just going to be in Genesis 3. I think I can solve every problem right here. Well, 
He says, I, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Was Adam naked? No. He wasn't naked. He had, he had a fig belt on. He was, he was sporting a vine. He wasn't naked. See, naked is nothing. So he wasn't naked. So, so he really wasn't. Now, now, when you're when you're afraid, not the fear of God that brings wisdom, but when you're afraid, the bad fear that God has not given you a spirit of fear, fear. What does that fear do? Doesn't that fear invert reality? I don't know. Maybe doesn't it? Doesn't it? I don't know. Let's think. Hmm. Okay. So here's the first time in his existence that he's ever been covered. The very first time that he has ever in his life not been naked, and guess what he tells God he is? Naked. When you get afraid of something, it inverts reality, doesn't it? Yes. If, if fear makes you think that what isn't is. That's how fear works. So it doesn't just invert reality for you. It always, that's what it does. And so now you're seeing for the very first time the first human being in history that wasn't naked going, I'm naked. Because he's afraid. Because it's inverting reality. I think that's pretty instructive. Now that he's covered, he feels naked. And he desires to flee. Hmm. See, every time my reality gets inverted, my automatic instinct is to bolt. Every time. Every single time. Every single... There's never been a time in my life that I didn't sense reality invert and I didn't want to take off running. Never. You ever been walking along at night and all of a sudden the bushes start rattling? Your reality just inverted and tchoom. Now you don't even know what's in the tree. You're in the bush. You don't, you don't need to know. See, you're walking and you're, you're re and it's quiet. And so in your mind, you're thinking, okay, it's quiet. So quiet's going to be good. And then if it's not quiet, it freaks us out. That's what fear does. And so then you run home and you run in and you're huffing and puffing, you know, and your parents go, or your wife goes, what's wrong, honey? What, what? And you go, I don't know. Well, what did you see? Well, I don't know. Oh, so you just ran in here like a maniac, but you didn't say, well, no, I didn't technically see anything, but I heard something. Well, what did you hear? Well, it started ruffling. Well, well how do you know what it was? I don't know what it was. I don't need to know. It's just something happened. You see? See how messed up we get? We don't even know what we're running. So the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. See, I wanted you to get this for a reason. There's none righteous. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. Why? How come nobody goes after God? Because since the fall, Adam, you think just Adam and Eve ran away from God? Every time somebody says, yeah, I mean, I was looking for God. You were not looking for God. What planet are you on? You wasn't looking for nothing. You were running from God. You got found because He found you. But this is what the Bible says. No one seeks after God. Why? Because of sin. That's why. Because since that moment in the garden, we've been running ever since. And then Adam again to fight God, which is what we all do. We start fighting Him. And then He says, well, the woman that you gave me, see, it's your fault. I'm fighting against you. So here we have God's perfect creation with God's image bearers in that perfect creation. Everything the way God intended for it to be. And it all comes crashing down. 
and we see all the ramifications that, that are, are taught to us about Adam and Eve through this experience that explain to us how we are the way we are. And in the midst of this, as if it's all not bad enough, they're not, you know, we're not just afraid of God and we're not just fleeing God, but we're literally fighting God. And what is God's response to this? How does He respond to this disaster when He should just mow everything down? Just, just light the whole thing on fire and burn it all up. That's what He ought to do. But notice what happens. For example, in, in verse 9, Then the Lord God calls to Adam and says to him, Where are you? And then in verse 13, And the Lord God, again, Yahweh Elohim, instead of just Elohim. Yahweh Elohim says to the woman, what is this that you have done? So, Yahweh God comes looking. Man doesn't initiate reconciliation. We're running in the garden and we're running now. And every single person in this room that saved got saved when they were running from God. And while you were running, you were fighting. Now all those verses in the New Testament that talk about how we're, we're enemies of God all make sense, don't they? Yes, absolutely. Just like Adam and Eve, same thing. It all just perfectly lines up. So when God asks these questions, now it all comes together. Well, why does He say, where are you? Why does He ask, why would this all-knowing God say, where are you, or... Did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to? God doesn't, he's not, he doesn't want, he's setting them up. He's, 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 this is a, both of those questions are like lightning bolts of grace. That's what that is. I hope you see that. It's not just because God's connecting with them. It's what he says. It's the whole thing that's going on here. He doesn't want information. He wants repentance. He's giving them, He is drawing them to Himself. He's saying, he's saying, why don't you repent right now? Where are you? Like, I know where you are. What I'm wanting you to do is say, Father, I made a huge mistake. I made a huge mistake. I should never have doubted Your goodness. But that's not what they do. But that's what the question's about. When he asked Eve, he said, well, did you eat of the tree? I mean, come on, that's the dumbest question in the world. That would be dumb for you and me. For God, that's really just moronic. He does not want, he's not asking her for information. He is opening the door. It's a grace, it's a lightning bolt of grace. He's saying, did you eat of the tree? Can't you just, I can just picture y'all down, kneeling down, you know, looking at your little five-year-old going, you know, they got chocolate all over their face and you're going, did you get in the cookie jar? You don't want information. What are you doing? You know what you want them to say? Yes, and I'm so sorry that I did. That's what you want. Same thing. God wants repentance. This is why God ignores their answers. You notice that? He asks a question. And then they, they don't take the road to repentance. And so he just, he, he doesn't straighten out what they say. In other words, how come God doesn't go, mm, oh, the woman I gave you? Hey, let me, let me tell you a little bit of something here, Padna. He just goes right past it. And then when Eve does the blame shift and says, well, it's the serpent's fault. It's not my, God doesn't straighten her out. How come he doesn't straighten them out? He just, I drive people, I do that all the time. It drives people crazy. They'll ask me a question and I'll just keep on going like it never even happened. Because it's a, because it's a, it's not a, it's rhetorical. In other words, I'm trying to, I, I hear what you're saying, but I'm trying to go to where we need to go to resolve what we're talking about and that's not the path we're taking and I just go right on by. And they're hung up on I didn't answer the question. Because it's meaningless information. See, so God just lets it go. 
So here's what he does say. But when he speaks, then it's the best part. What does he say? So in verse 15, boy, did you ever read this and think, now here's the best news ever. It's probably the best news in Genesis right here. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And then he says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The very first gospel proclamation right there. God responds to this moment right here as He sends these two lightning bolts of grace questions for repentance. They don't bite, so now every single thing has gone wrong that can go wrong, and then God says, so here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send one through her seed who's going to crush your head, Satan. His response to this moment is the Gospel. That's the very first time in the Bible that you go, if you were very carefully reading the Bible, you would stop and take a big gulp and say, hmm, God has a plan here. He's about to do something. Why does He say this? Now, sin's broken, the re broken them, broken us personally. So He's going to send one through the seed that's going to crush His head. So all of your sin, past, present, and future, is going to be forgiven. That it's going to be separated as far as from the east as from the west. The Bible says that your Nasty, filthy, dirty, rotten, scuzzball life, just like mine, is going to be white as snow. So personally what he's going to do to reverse the effects of sin is he's going to forgive all of our sin personally. He's going to forgive it all, past, present, future, all of it in one foul swoop. Then relationally, how it tore everything apart relationally, he's going to come as a father. A father who's going to send his son and through that son who's going to be an elder brother who's going to make a way for you and me to be adopted into the family so that we become children. So we've solved the personal problem of sin through the forgiveness of our sin, but then the relational problem is solved because now we're going to relate to God as a, as a child, as a father or a son through this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we've been adopted into this family, so now we're children. So we're co-heirs with Christ in this new relationship. And then spiritually, what sin destroyed, He's going to reverse that by putting His Spirit within you so that all of the broken fellowship, so that your sin can never be held against you personally because it's all been forgiven. That relationally, you can never be separated from the Father because the Bible says that you're held in the palm of His hand, that nothing can break the bond between you and the Father through the sacrifice of the Son. And then spiritually, He's going to put His Spirit inside of you so that there will never be a millisecond of your life. That both personally and, and relationally and spiritually, it's all been solved. Everything's been solved in the Gospel. It's all been reversed, but not just reversed so that it's fixed, but reversed so that it's indestructible, so that it can never be rebroken. You see, because here's the thing you got to realize tonight about everything we talked about, that you're about to get up and leave and go home and you need to be reminded of these very important truths. That you, although you can sin, your sin can never be held against you. Never, never, ever, ever can your sin ever be held against you. Ever. The, the, the bond between you and your Father can never be broken and you will never, ever, ever be alone because He is within you. So you're still in the same flesh that Adam and Eve had in the garden, broken and torn apart into a million pieces. And God didn't just fix the problem. 
but he put an indestructible solution in place so that you're invincible. That Satan, that's why you're more than a conqueror. Don't you see? That's why Satan has no more power over you. All he can do is deceive you. All he can do is torment you and bother you, but he cannot hurt you. Your salvation makes you invincible to all of the weapons of warfare that Satan can ever get his hands on. Ever. Praise the Lord. So when you are dealing with the flesh and you feel this shame and this guilt and you're fighting with God and you're, you're in, in this place where you don't want to be and you're trying to battle with all this, let me just give you some great, great advice tonight. I want you to do what Adam and Eve did. I want you to just, just blame God. Just blame Him. Say, God, I blame you for everything. Everything. Your son died on the cross for my sin. You know what Calvary is? Calvary is Jesus Christ hanging on a cross saying, blame me. Blame me. I take the blame. Give it to me. Blame me for everything you've ever done in your life. Blame me. Blame me for every wicked thing you've ever done. Blame me. And I'll take it. And He's took it. And so therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You know why? He took all the blame. And Satan can't do anything about it. Because when Jesus rose from the grave, He crushed His head. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Let's get a handle on that. Father, we thank You for tonight. God, Your Word is so spectacular and wonderful. Lord, thank You for speaking to us. Thank You for giving us ears to hear. Thank You for my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Thank You for giving us a hunger and a thirst for You. Lord, We know, I know, Father God, that You only you speak through me because You have hungry people here. I know that. And I thank You for that, Lord. And I pray that we would be mindful tonight as we leave. That God, it was a mess in Genesis 3. It was a, it was a disaster. But You didn't just fix the problems. You eternally solved everything in Jesus. And so every saved person in this room, every single one of us who is saved, we have nothing to be afraid of. There is no weapon formed against us that can prosper. Because you've crushed His head. And we thank You, Lord Jesus, for what You've done. And we thank You, God, for adopting us into Your family, allowing us to be Your children, and giving us Your Spirit that we'd never be alone. In Jesus' name, we love You. Amen. Amen.